Well, welcome to the Beyond Cinema Studio up here at Sundance, Mr. Mark Gordon. Firstly, um, congratulations on the recent nominations for Nebraska. Mm. Um, I know you're up here with another film, Drunk Town's Finest, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, those guys are coming in later today for some portraits as well. Oh, good. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, I guess, working with the great Alexander Payne. I mean, do you find that your collaboration on a project like this is most often with other musicians or with the director? Um, more with the director, at least these days. Yeah. Uh, maybe in my start, uh, when I was getting into film and and film scoring, I, it came about more through licensing opportunities. People were licensing music from my band yeah. or just from my library. So that's how I kind of came into it. But, but now, yeah, I work one-on-one -on -one with the director. And what was, the t what was it like the first time you met Alexander? Where were you? you um, I went down to LA for, the, for just a screening that they held for me um, to get a sense of it. This was in advance of Cannes, uh, and they were working on that cut of the film. And it, um, it had evolved really organically, but in the beginning, the, the temporary score that was in the early version of this thing had a few of my uh, tunes in it, and after some back and forth with their staff, the 28, or 27 out of the 28 cues were mine. And wow. so it just, it had just sort of happened that, you know, he fell in love with this stuff. So. Had he had another composer on who was looking at it, and that, but they'd kind of got that temp love? I know temp love is a, a problem. Yeah, it came, it, this was a case of temp love. He had, he, he's worked on all his films besides Descendants that didn't have a lot of original music yeah. with Rolf Kent. And I think probably the plan in the beginning was to work with Rolf. Um, I worked on the can cut, um, not hired on necessarily as even composer then, but I worked on my cues and kind of cut them to picture. Yeah. Um, and, and then went to Cannes with the film. And then once that was done, it was, he had decided it was the score for the film, so. What was the specific mandate? What was the narrative that the score was adding that they loved? Um, well, there were several. Um, and it had as much to do with what he didn't want as what he wanted, honestly. Because he didn't, even though this is a, you know, a, a heartland and an Americana film, he didn't want anything overtly Americana in it. He didn't want banjos and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? He, that was something he was really against. And he saw this kind of black and white cinematography and, and his love for the planes. He, he called it Italian cinema on the planes, and thus the accordion that runs through this thing. So, so anything sort of overt Americana as we were trying different cues is what wasn't working for him. Um, he wanted something that was relatively spare. Yeah. He wasn't looking for something that was going to overshadow the fairly intimate nature of the film. You know, it's, it's a lot about what, what is and what isn't going on in these characters' heads. Yeah. Or Woody's case, what isn't going on. But, so in um, that case, was there a particular moment of the film that everyone was finding challenging in terms of the sounds? Yeah, there were. There, I mean, like with any film, there were cues that just popped right in, and there were other ones that we worked on quite a bit. The, yeah. uh, there's a scene where um, Woody goes back and visits his childhood home, which is in, it's totally dilapidated, falling apart, but he, he's, uh, despite his coming dementia, he's able to remember these older memories, as is often the case with people dealing with that. And as he walks through this old house, uh, that was kind of the delicate cue that we, we went back and forth with a number of times, and we settled on a solo piano thing for that. So. If you had to do a score for Alexander Payne, the man, as he walks around on a daily basis, <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of mood, what kind That's of genre... That's a great question, yeah. What kind of genre would follow Alexander hmm. around in his daily life? You know, that's interesting, because he is, he's a fascinating guy. Um, I mean, he's a really learned guy. He's a really smart person. He himself is a musician. I mean, it's, it's one of the few... Um, directors I've worked with where we've like sat at the piano together and sung melodies and you know he's in the harp session down at Warner Brothers he's getting onto the harp for a minute and messing around I mean wow. he's very actively involved so I think you know something musical uh, not something too simple for him something with some European but also something I guess I would say honest and heartfelt you know at the same time yeah so he seems to be a bit of a renaissance man he is definitely yeah. that, yeah. Um, so, for you, can you compare him to any other directors that you work with? Does it, does it like in, in terms of either st being in stark contrast to someone or similar to someone else? Um, I would say about Alexander specifically that he, uh, maybe with one exception, a German director that I worked with who's had several films here, uh, Uli Galki. 
Um, he is he is the person that knows what he wants the the most. He's very uh, he's very clear, and and it's not there isn't a question, and there there isn't kind of wondering about the, what's not working in a queue or what is or you know what the directive is. He's you know he's got a really um, clear vision is the way I would describe it. Where's so, home? Where's home for you? Portland, Oregon. And so, do you get to other than this, where they'd already shot the film at the point when they were kind of lining up the cues and, mm. and brought you in? Um, do you like going to the sets of the films that you're scoring? And yeah, I, it's not as often, I think, for most composers that you're brought in at that stage of it. I have been in several cases. Yeah, um, I'm often brought in earlier than I was for Nebraska. And to be clear, you know, they're we went back after I was hired and re-recorded stuff and uh, the only reason we didn't submit for Oscars is there were these a couple of themes from a previous film of mine that he really loved so we we didn't meet the criteria for that. Which films were, which film was that? Um, well in in particular it was a film called Sweetland which oh, yeah. was yeah it was an um, independent spirit award winner yeah and uh, it was a great a great film very different film and that's actually in some ways the most interesting thing for me is you know having written these themes for different characters and a very different vibe of a film and having to having to rearrange my brain to have them make sense with this and it's it's inter it's like a weird calculus that you know you have do to go through you, do you find it to that point do you find that your personal joy in scoring a film like let's say it's set somewhere very specific is in finding that ethnic relationship or that natural indigenous relationship to where that film is set or to go counter against it? Um, I think it really depends on the film. I would probably lean towards the latter in most cases. Yeah. And I'm not as into the kind of on the nose thing. But that said, when I scored Comrades and Dreams, which is something that was in world cinema here a couple of years ago with Uli Galki, yeah. the German director, we were in India, we were in Burkina Faso, we were in North Korea, we were in Wyoming. And that's a film where I'm working to unite those different areas and so finding common ground between them. But at the same time, I have to respect where the film is and, and the sense of place. And, and actually in Drunk Town, it's a good, it's a good uh, example of this because there was really a sense of place on, on, this, on this reservation where that is. Indian right. reservation so, where it's shot. Yeah. So where was that? Where is that specific location? It's in New Mexico on the Navajo yep. reservation. And I was brought into that film way earlier than usual <laughs> because uh, Sidney Freeland, the director, and I were both um, fellows at the Sundance Institute and we were paired there. Um, each uh, director that's up there and each composer end up being paired together by Peter Golub, the master's uh, choice. What is, so. what is the magic behind the Sundance Labs? Is, is that something that, you know, will kind of keep keeping on for you as kind of a golden moment? I, I really loved it. Um, it was, you know, for me, um, it's changed now. Now they do it down at Skywalker. Um, they have access to this amazing facility and also to the San Francisco Symphony Players and to a real sound mixer. I was, this is three years ago now. So back yeah. for me, I was in a trailer on the side of a mountain. Um, I love Skywalker Ranch, but that said, I brought, you know, I came up there with my car packed to the gills with weird old instruments that I collect and moved them into this trailer till there wasn't room to move and, you know, just worked for two and a half weeks solid, every, you know, 16 hour days. Um, yeah. You know, my wife had been saying to my son, daddy's going to film camp, you know, and it, at one point I was thinking, you know, looking into the hiking opportunities and some tennis up there, it was not like that. It's a real trial by fire and it's great. and. It's a rare opportunity in the sense that you have six composers there and you're working on these different cues and you come in in the morning with whatever you've done and you screen these things back to back. So you're seeing one scene from a film with seven different options for it, the seventh being the one that was actually in the picture. And this is wide ranging stuff from um, the rock in, uh, what is it, the Tooth Fairy? Yeah. <laughs> to, um, a classic Sundance yeah. movie, by the way. <laughs> right. To The Great Debaters, which is a great the Denzel Washington thing, uh, How to Train Your Dragon, all these kind of, they're kind of vetting you and checking you out and seeing what it's going to mean. And there are these great advisors that come up and the directors come up. And, and, and the final question, perhaps the obvious one, uh, in terms of your own personal inspirations and personal journey, taken from, would you either name names who are composers or musicians for, for who's influenced you? 
Um, it's a it's a question I'll try to keep concise because I could have a very long answer. I mean, I grew up. My father's a composer and conductor, so I grew up around music and around him. He was a huge inspiration. Um, he got me into a lot of American uh, new classical music, Ives and Copeland and that kind of stuff. At the same time, I was in a Led Zeppelin cover band, uh, so I was doing Who the other you? side of it. <laughs> Who are you in the cover You know, band? it's a funny question because I was kind of Jimmy Page and Robert Plant until my voice changed. And then it was like Jim Morrison at best. And that was about all I could sing. <laughs> so. um, but anyway, no. And, and you know, for film composers, I, I really love Gabriel Yared. I really love some of the classic folks and my, my own group, Tin Hat or Tin Hat Trio, that um, has been the vehicle for a lot of my musical output. It was really influenced by that stuff across the board. We were a composer collective, but... You can hear Nina Rota and Ennio Morricone and some of the classic stuff in there. So. Very cool. Well, thanks for joining us. Congratulations yeah. again on the success of the film and its reception. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. On. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Thank you.